call. They didn't phone me. My alarm went off. I reached over and tapped it off. And, and I don't know whether there's a noise outside or just something, but I woke up, panicked, looked over the clock, and it's 8.05. I run like hell to get down here, and nobody's here. And I thought, good grief, did they all leave me? <laughs> but there wasn't anybody back here. So I went back down back to the room, and apparently in the process of reaching over there, I reset the clock. It was six something. <laughs> so you were awake. Uh, well, I'm awake now. Uh, this has been in process. We're thinking about doing this now for oh, at least a good four years. There's a number of reasons for it. Um, like I said, I feel real uncomfortable about being up here. Last. Supposing before last, I come here and I really felt bad because all these guys with PhDs and everything was getting up and uh, and I really started putting myself down and about two days into the symposium, I was about ready to go home. And I was wondering why I was here, 40 some odd years old, never done anything and, and so forth and so on. Then I got to thinking, some of the stuff that they were talking about, I had done 10 years ago. I hadn't pursued it, but I had done it when I started learning about Tesla and started putting some of this stuff together. And I have become a personal PR man, an advocate for Tesla, for his work. Uh, I've learned that I have to be a little bit careful because I get a little bit overbearing with when it comes to other people's work sometimes when they looks like they're shading Teslas a little bit. Uh, at any rate, I've got to, I hope you'll forgive me for reading this, but I've prepared it a certain way and for at least the first page I'm going to read this and then the rest of it is ad lib, I think. Uh, I'm grateful for the Tesla Society for allowing me the opportunity to, to stand before you and either bore the heck out of you or teach you something. Uh, I think that while I've got this opportunity, it would be ungrateful of me to not thank a few people that have helped us be here. First of, all, of these men, of course, is Dr. Nikola Tesla, James Corum Leland, and, and Kenneth Corum. Leland Anderson, Harry Goldman, and Bob Gulka. I know there's others. I know that, that there's been an awful lot of them that have put up coils and gone out and educated people and things like that, and I don't mean to slight them. Uh, Bob Gulka, for the reason why, is he put up the first big large coil that tweaked our imagination and proved that Tesla really did something. We can go back and do it. So it's, from that point, it seems that we've been coming and says, well, he'd really done it. We've seen it in modern terms. Now we we believe it. We have this phobia about putting down things we, we can't explain and so forth. Harry Goldman, for those of, of us that are members of the Tesla Coil Builders Association, uh, there's a wealth of information that he has given out to all of us. And uh, for those of you that are aware of it, he, I guess he's going into surgery for the next week or so. So you might keep him in your prayers. Then comes Leland Anderson. The gentleman who has shared his information, who has been kind of the world's historian on Tesla, put together the 56th symposium, at least I believe that's accurate, and have written some books and articles and that to two different organizations to keep Tesla alive and his ideas. Uh, and of course, the new book, which is almost invaluable if you've got the old book, referring to Tesla's Colorado Springs Notes, from what I understand. It allows you some intuitive understanding about what Tesla was doing, why he was doing it, and what the processes were. And of course, last but not least, my two favorite friends, at least I hope I can call them friends, James and Kenneth Corum. They have taken Tesla's work, gone back and explained so that we can understand it, seeing as Tesla talked in 1890s and terms, and we're sitting here trying to figure out what he says when he talks to us in his manual. They've come and interpreted it for us so that we can go and tap into that knowledge and produce some of the stuff that will allow us to do some other things. One more brief statement and then I'll quit reading. And this is a statement from Tesla to a symposium probably very much like this. I, I, it's in his uh, lectures, or not lectures and patents, but the one little small book for his high, vo high frequency stuff. Um, I believe it was one before the Franklin Institute. 
Tesla said, there is no dearer apparatus to the electrician. For the ablest among, us, among you, I dare say, down to the inexperienced student, to your lecturer, we have all passed many delightful hours in experimenting with induction coils. We have watched it play. We have thought and pondered over the beautiful phenomena which is discovered or disclosed to our ravishing, ravished eyes. So well is known the apparatus, so familiar the phenomena to everyone, that my courage fails me when I think that I have ventured to address so able an audience, that I have ventured to entertain you with the same old subject. That was an understatement. Here in, here in reality is the same apparatus and here is the same phenomena, only the apparatus is operated somewhat differently. The phenomena presented is different in that, is in a different aspect. Some of the results we will find, we will find as expected, others will, will surprise us, but all cap, ha, captivate our attention and for, in scientific, and for in scientific investigation, each novel result achieves, achieved may be the center of new departure. Each novel fact learned may lead to improved developments. I believe that fervently. That's one of the reasons why I'm up here shaking, as you can hear my voice. Uh, when I first started this little project, first started thinking about it, I'm lazy. Uh, I love to tweak things. When I go to the haunted houses, I go with the, that, that's kind of where I got started with my coils. Um, Matter of fact, I might as well start at that point. Uh, this was my first coil. Hand wound on a PVC pipe. So see, anybody can do them, even me. Um, I had never seen a coil fired up. I had read all the literature on it. I put it together. We get about 12 inches of discharge off that one when I work it in, in, in a system. Uh, I imagine I can get more now that I, 15 years later, know a little bit more. Seen as the little one right here, I can pull almost as much discharge off of there. And it arcs back to itself and it burns holes in it. That's why it's got tape around it and does all kinds of things. Whenever I fire it up, I have to retard it or else I've got voltage all over the place. And you'll notice a lot of my, well, let's put it this way. After about this one here, all my coils started becoming almost one-to-one -one ratios. I have this affinity for one-to-one -one ratios. Tesla's extra coil was eight feet three inches by seven feet nine inches, almost a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, I've been told by radio engineers that that gives you the best trans transfer of power, except when you work with Dr. Corm's formulas. You get them a little bit too short, and it don't work no more in his computer program. So you have to tweak that a little bit. That's not belittling, and I'm just telling you that's a problem I have with it because I design a little bit differently. Uh, for those of you that are in radio, you already know that Tesla coils are all over. This little one inch by two inch winding on here. Um, roughly speaking, when I, and what I've done is I've designed this so I can go back and tap with it when I play and I use a little uh, spark gap to uh, tweak it. And I put, I, have, I didn't bring it with me, but I have, I've made a little toroid that I put on top of it and I can draw about two inches of discharge off this thing. This was, I think, about the third or fourth coil that I made. I work it in a half-wave form. It has two sticks. I'm sorry, it's dirty. I didn't get it wiped off. And we arc it up over the top. And I've got one of these on a control panel that I use for the haunted houses. We, I can pull 17 inches of discharge back, back and forth from it, which really isn't very much. But I can turn it up here and get 17 inches of discharge, too. So. Uh, and this, of course, is another little one. Here again, I'm back to a one-to-one -one ratio. This is the apparatus that I finally put together um, for, I'm not sure which coil right now. I run several coils off of it. What it consists of, and if you look at Tesla's diagram, and he shows the one that says, these are the components. These are all the components. This is a neon transformer. This is the capacitors, and this is just a kind of a variable spark gap. All they are is I've taken some, and I got this from the University of Utah. I happened to be up there talking to the science department. He says, well, let me show you ours, and he pulls it out, and I thought, gee, that is a novel idea. And all you do is run a 
normally what I'll do is I'll take this here and just by run it back and forth, you can change the gapping and change the tuning. So you do a little bit of fine tuning with it. And of course, when I run this coil with it, I have to get it way up here so that it don't really fly for me and then I don't, I don't burn little holes in, in the coil. So this is essentially what I've got for my power supply. Uh, power, well, for this one here. Um, I'm kind of trying to talk about materials that were, that's used. This coil is PVC pipe. Now, I don't particularly like PVC pipe because one of my first experiences was that I made a coil similar to this with PVC pipe and all of a sudden things started smoking and all of a sudden my coil collapsed. And what had happened is internally it had produced an arc down through the center and melted the plastic. So I went back and filled the, P the it was a four inch PVC pipe, put one of these tubes in, sealed it off, and I didn't have any more problem with it. But I would much rather use different materials. And this, of course, is phenolic and just an end plate that I put on it. And I've done this so that I can put different things on it. Originally, it was for the uh, display. But most of my displays anymore are a little bit bigger than what I can haul out every time. This is something that I had a chance, opportunity to go up and see Harry Goldman, and he gave me this. He had a little coil wound on it. It's a little emergency form. So we can use almost anything to wind coils. If you look at some of the early photos, Tesla had conical coils that he wound. I would assume it's probably difficult because you have to start this side and wind up or else it slides off the end. Pardon? What is the advantage of a conical? Uh, well, it's a pro and con both ways. One, one it produces a multi-frequency, because at least so I've been told, because you have different uh, diameters. Um, the only advantage is that you pull the top in, but when you start getting coils that reach over outside and down to the bottom, it doesn't really matter too much anymore. And I think that that's why you'll find out that Tesla didn't use them anymore. He did, however, make pancake coils and almost any coil that you've ever seen, Tesla probably made at one point in time. Uh, he goes through a whole dissertation in his book of we went back and rewound coils and made them longer or shorter or whatever to do the different experiments that he was playing around with. Um, Dr. Corum, four years ago, made a coil out of a stovepipe or some of that effect, or Kenny. Uh, works up in the megahertz region, so anything can be made into Tesla coils depending upon what you want to do with them and understanding the principles how they work. Uh, I've tried to show you a little bit of variety. This is, this is my test. This is my induction coil. I like flat spiral primaries for a number of reasons, because they're down, they're out of the way. You don't have to build another form that goes up around the outside. You don't have to worry about the arc overs. Uh, and I realize this does not give you a correct analogy of what your inductance is going to be for your primary. But when you're playing around, it, it really doesn't matter all that much. It'll get you in the ballpark. And it's just something you can put multi-type of coils on and and do. That's kind of what I've started with. Uh, my equipment, and I'll, I'll get to these two other coils in a minute. My equipment, this is an HP. It, it's, I told somebody it was a 202, but it's 200. Yeah. Hey, uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, uh, sine wave oscillator. It originally only went to 600 kilohertz or 650. Um, it had a big dial on it, a little dial on it, and you'd turn it, and sometimes the big dial wouldn't turn, and the little dial would, and I couldn't get the sucker, and I would, every time it would jump, it would jump 500 kC, well, not quite that bad, uh, 5 kC, and all of a sudden I couldn't keep track of it. So I went back and modified it with a little, yeah, let me see if I can show you. Did you turn it off? I'll be okay tomorrow. This is a result of playing around with it Tuesday night when I had a little wire about that long on it and I fired up my coil and now my uh, gating system don't want to work very well. I, I shouldn't have put an antenna out there. Um, this coil here, uh, I walked about three or four feet back, fired it, and I can pull, just by dropping uh, wires off my meter, I can pull a thousand volts on the meter. So you gotta be real careful with the, the coils. Anyway, this is the driving force for whatever we have. I've got this hooked up to, to this little scope here that has a real hard time triggering. And that will tell me what this generator is putting out. 
it's not calibrated, it's just more of an indicator. This scope here is an older scope. It is calibrated, or supposed to be, at least until I got hold of it. Um, this was a result of having a lot of trouble with the two big coils trying to get them to talk to me and let me know what they are doing. And they weren't talking the same language I was, and I've had a heck of a time with them. And that's been three or four months in the process of trying to get this sucker to, to do what it's supposed to do. Anyway, basically that's what my equipment is. And seeing as I couldn't bring the big coil, my son-in-law made this photo for me some time ago. This is a coil that I use, or have used, in the haunted houses. Okay, it's eight feet in diameter and about four feet of winding. It sets up on a plat on on legs, as you can see. It's driven by, uh, let's see, can't see the, the, it's a pull transformer that I use to drive it with, uh, for about 14,000 volts, and about two amps coming off the other end. We, we put in uh, 220 on one side, and we draw out to 14,000 on the other side. When you play around with normal transformers, and we're not talking about transformers like this we use for neon transformers because these have a built-in current limiter on them. Uh, you can also burn them up. I know I lost a couple of them trying to drive. Well, I don't have it. It was one previous to this one here. Uh, by the way, for those who are interested, well, maybe I better explain this. We have, I have pulled 10.2 inches point-to-point -point discharge off of this coil. I don't know if that's very much. It's awful big and cumbersome to get around. I'm not sure. I'm looking at Bill Wysocks and some of the other gentlemen who are small and narrow and being able to get 20 feet of discharge off of it, I feel somewhat at a loss. Um, in this picture, I've got two primaries on it. I eventually got rid of them. I've only got one primary on it. It's, it consists of about 31 turns of 10 gauge wire, and that's what I use for my primary driver. Uh, originally up on top, this is flexible heat duct tubing. Originally I had a wire. I could never control the voltage. It was always going where it wanted to go. I couldn't get it to do anything I wanted it to. So one day I happened to see a camera, I don't, I think it was the little devices that we use on VWs to run the heating system. And they were flexible and they were metal. And I thought, well, gee, what a novel opportunity. And went over to the heat duct place and they have them anywhere from four inches to 12 inches. This one happens to be eight inches. And so three lengths got me around the top of the coil and I use that as my capacitive loader. It changed the frequency from about 100 kC to about 103 kC. Uh, roughly speaking. Uh, I wasn't really concerned about a lot of scientific detail when I put these together. All I was concerned is maximum output and scare the hell out of the kids. What we did on that, for those who are in maybe that mode or, or do that thing, what we did is we put a chicken wire fence around it. And then what we did is, with some separated by two by fours, one side went to ground and the other side floated. And you got to be careful. The reason why we floated the other side was because when you touch it, you get a little buzz out of it when it's running. Otherwise, you don't get anything. But I didn't want the kids sticking their fingers up and running through and getting zapped with however many volts that happens to be. Somebody's told me four million. It would be nice, but I don't think that's what it is. At any rate, uh, I hadn't realized how awesome that was one night until I happened to walk by and the lights were out and one of the kids I had operated fired it up. And to have electrical discharge come out to you like this, it was one heck of an awesome feeling. And I realized why all the kids were running past the room. <laughs> okay. uh, I have, on that big coil, we had a young lady who didn't listen to instructions and walked, she worked for the, the haunted house, and walked in, and I guess it was, at the time we had a big 18-inch ball up on the top, and she figured, I guess, well, the electricity comes off the ball, so I'm okay up on next to the coil. Well, about four windings down from the top or something like that, it came out and zapped her and, I guess, hit her in her forehead. Um, probably shouldn't say this, but I think she wet her pants, so I was told. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't there. Oh, yeah, she definitely did then. Uh, she never come back in my area again, from what I understand. <laughs> she was gone from three, for three days. Uh, it did not hurt her. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that this stuff is dangerous. You get over in this section of it, and it's lethal. It'll kill you. Uh, that's not my disclaimer. That's a matter of fact. And I'll tell you why I say that. Uh, in 
playing around with the big, was it the big coil? No, it was, okay. On the one I just showed you the picture, I've got a big brother to that one. It's eight feet in diameter, it's eight feet tall. It's all bundled up and put away. I haven't run it for almost 10 years. Uh, back in 84, I wanted to make a Tesla coil, three coil system. We had a 26 foot fence. Oh, we got some beautiful arcs from the 26 fence over to the other, but I can never get it to fly. Uh, when you're working with coils, remember a couple of things. Coils work differently when you produce different sizes. When we took this particular coil over and we, well, I'll go back a little bit. We, we worked in an old laundry and we had a beautiful ground. They had big water pipes and it was hooked to an artesian well. And I mean, we had one fantastic ground system. Um, and we hadn't really thought about it because that's where I hooked it and didn't pay any attention. Then one, a couple years later, we took this, uh, this coil, put it over in another unit, hooked it up back to the primary, like we normally do, right? This little sucker stuck, talked to itself, 35 kc, up and down the scale as you'd go up with the oscillator. Wouldn't oscillate. Drove us nuts, couldn't figure out what we was doing wrong. <clears throat> Come to find out, big coils, you've got to hook to ground. You can't hook back to the primary or it don't work. I'm not sure what this one does. I haven't figured it out yet. Still working on it. Uh, the reason why I tell you that is, first off, to let you know that I do have a lot of failures, as I'm sure most scientists and those people who play with it. We need to learn from our failures as well as our triumphs, if we can have such things. Uh, I told a friend of mine once upon a time, test coils are not normal. They don't work normal. And he says, no, he says, they gotta work like any other coil. Sure they do. Well, this guy's big, intimidating. I didn't know him very well at the time. He scared the hell out of me. Uh, and I get real timid when I'm around people that's supposed to know because he works at a radio station and is supposed to know all this stuff. And he got me ticked off to the point where I finally talked back to him. And I guess Ken being the person that he was, this is not Ken Corm, it's Ken Meyer. <laughs> I doubt very seriously he'd ever do that to me. At any rate, uh, being the person he did, went home, Pulled out his test coil that he made in high school, said, hooked it up to a signal generator, hooked it up to a scope, and I'm sure he played with it all night long. And he came back the next day, and I think he's denied this already, but he came back the next day and told me, he says, you know, those coils don't work normal. Well, we know they're linear, they're not linear devices, and so therefore they don't talk in terms of graphs, do 45 degree angles and straight angles and, and do things and it does weird things. And, and uh, well, maybe I better get into this one right now and then I'll start showing you some of this stuff. When I designed this coil, and if I seem like I'm rambling, raise your hand and tell me to shut up and get back to where we were. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Show and tell. Okay, show and tell. Reason for the coil. Like I said, this project's been in, in for almost two years. It's been in the, the put together, finished stage now since early November when I started wind in the coil. Now I realize that people say, well, gee, that's an awful long time to do that. In the process, I made a glass lathe, converted a glass lathe into something so I could wind this thing first off. I had to build the forms. I had to design it, which really caused me a lot of problems because it really started out at 10 inches in diameter. It's now 17. Um, it's 24 inches long. The wood is 24 inches long. I ended up making the insulators because like most Tesla people know, you can't buy this stuff. You got to learn how to make it. Uh, and of course the stands and all the other stuff that goes with it. And then I hooked the generator up to it. And let's see if I can show you what I've got so far. Straight line, that's it. I knew there was something wrong with it. Okay, I've got two traces. The, the top one on the top goes up to a little loop that I've got up here. And all it is is a coax cable that's wrapped around a I think, think there's four turns in there. And if you look in the radio handbook, it shows you how to do this. They call it a little sniffer coil. And I think it was originally designed to be used with a, uh, um, yeah, one of those scopes, a spectrum analyzer, so that you can find leakage. I don't know if you have, well, I'd, let me fire it up. If I can get it to fire up. You can see a ring. I guess that's a good indication. 
I always hate working with scopes, and I always hate working in front of people because I can never get the stupid things to do what I want them to do when I want them to do it. Believe it or not, I did this last night, and it was supposed to be real easy to put back together. Oh, I feel real stupid. Pardon? Okay, what I did is I've, I've got a makeshift ground, and it may not be helping me any. Well, let me let me let me go through the theory first off, and then we'll we'll explain why I've got a lot of failures. Okay, the theory on the, the putting this coil together was I wanted to design a three three coil system because I had not seen any documentation on three-coil systems, and somebody says, all right, here's how you do it. And I don't want to give you numbers and say, all right, here's how you do it, by the numbers, and so forth and so on. But I do want to, to let you know that there should be an easy way of putting some equipment on it and being able to go through the process, understanding the theory, and without having to play around with it a whole lot. I mean, there's so many things, variables in, in Tesla coils that you can vary in order to produce and, uh, the perform improve the in performance to overcome other things. And I think Tesla's, uh, when you look, read his works, he shows you that because he says, I can design coils that will do almost anything if it's properly designed. You have to understand what his parameters are. Anyway, that was the purpose for, for building this three coil system from scratch. I wanted to go through the whole process. Uh, most of us, how we build the coils is, well, my first procedure was is to go find out how much wire I had of what. I had 17 gauge wire, spool of it, and I decided, all right, that's how much wire I've got. I figured out about how long it was, and I said, well, from that point, I want to design a coil that's going to operate at this frequency. So I chose 450 kC. Great frequency. For some reason, way in the back of my mind, it was something that sounded familiar. It was. 455 kc is what all your radios work on so if you get up in that and fire up a real big coil you wipe out all the radio stations in the united states <laughs> or you interfere with the if and then somebody's really ticked at you luckily when i went back and, and recalculated it i've got about 200 i've got 250 turns uh there's 11 turns per inch there's 22 and a quarter inch windings there's 200 let's see i already told you 250 turns that gives me a wavelength of approximately, a half wavelength of approximately 112 or 13 feet. That should tell me that my frequency should operate about 442 kc. According to Tesla, he says if you have a wavelength that physically is this long, the, re the normal frequency in real life is going to be a little bit shorter. So therefore, the frequency should be somewhat different. Uh, my coil is somewhat different, all right. I have a whole lot of problem with it. I know why it ain't working. The reason why it ain't working is because I'm, set, I'm trying to set it at the halfway point. The halfway point gives you a voltage minimum and a current maximum at the top. What we want to do is design a coil that works at a, at a halfway frequency, which means we're gonna have the voltage minimum at the top, so it gives us a low impedance. So when we match it up with a quarter wave, its bottom is low impedance, the top is a high impedance. What we're going to end up doing is pulsing this one that pulses that one, because when you start to do some analyzing on the coils, you're going to find out that they work at three separate groups. Primary works, and the secondary works, and then the extra coil works. And they do it all by, by each one of themselves. It's like cutting off the circuit when you, when you get them to, to start going. So at any rate, that's been one of my dilemmas because when you go from, I gotta be real careful with this crank because I don't have any. That's why I couldn't see my waveform. And I moved it up, so I'll put it back down there. What happens when you go into resonance? I hasn't done that before. That little weird stuff in there, I've never seen. That's interesting. Uh, okay, that's, that's the one that's going to my ground lead. So I'm probably getting some garbage off the, the deal. Now that's what I got at home. Tuesday night, I took the stuff all down. I figured I was gonna have to put it out in the garage, fire it up because the symposium was coming real soon. And I was gonna have to get up here and tell you how stupid I was. So I disconnected everything. And 
this was the last thing I disconnected. Didn't sit here with a frequency on it. It's hooked to ground. <coughs> if you disconnect it, well, it used to go to zero. Just like that. Yeah, well, it does after a while. It used to go to zero fairly quickly. Anyway, I plugged it back into the ground, and all of a sudden, I'm getting 800 and some odd kilohertz sitting on my thing hooked to ground. And then I've been wondering why every night I would take and fire the sucker up, put the numbers down on a piece of paper, go to work, come home the next morning, fire it back up, and it lied to me because it wasn't telling me the same thing it told me last night, the night before. And I would sit there all day long going over and over and over again. I'd change different configurations. I ended up putting one loop around the center. Matter of fact, I even connected it to it. Put one loop around the center and a couple of resistors out here. Um, and it still wouldn't tell me the truth. It would still tell me something different. Now, I don't know if something's being fed in, fed in b back from my grounding system or just what. Anyway, that's how we set this one up as a half wave. What we want to do is we want to set now a quarter wave up, but against an RF ground. I didn't understand what an RF ground was. A lot of things I don't understand. We use terms sometimes that, that we hear, but we don't know what they mean. I, was, I work for a vacuum tube company. We're now called, called Varian. We used to be called IMAC. Um, I walked into a piece of equipment and it says K on there. I'm sitting there, K, what the heck does K mean? And I had an old tube engineer that was taught us out at Trade Tech, and he says, and he told us some of the old signals, and as I got to thinking back, K's cathode. Well, gee, K, cathode starts with a C, doesn't it? Uh, pardon? In German, it starts with a C. Oh, that's where it comes from. Okay, that helps. Uh, I realize a lot of our old technology has carried over. Like we talk about B plus when we get into tube technology. So your plate voltage is a B plus. The reason why it was B plus is because that was the battery. It was a B group of batteries that give you your high voltage. You had an A battery and a B battery, and I don't think you had a, did you have a C also? Yeah. Okay. Cathode. Well, grid, grid was the A, as well, wasn't it? Okay. Well, I don't, I don't go back that far, and I haven't studied that, so I apologize for that. Even if I did, I wouldn't have known it anyway. But at any rate, he put the cathode on there, and I'm sitting there, what the heck does it mean? Um, so at any rate, so a lot of our terminology has carried over from back in the 20s, when, it, when things first got started. Uh, maybe that's good, maybe it isn't, because it, it alienates us from, is that time already? Oh, okay. Um, it alienates us from some of the people who walk in. It's like they, they, at our work, they want to put together a manual and says, all right, we want to pull people off the street and have them operate this. The guys can't even talk our language. What are you talking about? He gets in there, we've got a whole different terminology. And I imagine this is that way with most industries. Okay, back to that. The ground plane, the RF. Uh, I talked with Dr. Corum, bugged him a little bit. I went back and looked at the RLL manual, and it says here's what an RF ground is. So what I ended up doing down in my little basement, which is already crowded, my wife thinks I'm really nuts and she don't visit me down there when I'm down there. She says it's too depressing. I pulled up the rug, I shoved a piece of four by eight 20 gauge sheet metal underneath of it and put another one so I've got about a six foot by six foot plate underneath of where I'm working. I took that one and hooked it, put a ground lead off of that and pulled it over so I hooked up the equipment, run the other ground lead up through the wall and over to the water pipe. Now I know this water pipe goes straight out the main. I know because I had to put it in. So I've got a good grounding system, I hope. Anyway, now that you've got, you know what this frequency is. Now I've done everything backwards. Okay, I'll be the first to admit I should have done it differently. I should have done the quarter wave. Then I should come back over here and do it. Or maybe we can do it this way and we can still take wire off of this one. I'm real prone. I, I'm, I'm real frugal and I don't like to waste a lot of wire. So I really screw things up in the process. As you can see, that's the result of taking too much wire off by not knowing what I was, well, I don't want to say that way, by doing what I think the instruments told me to do. And I wound, before I, got ready to put it in the truck and come, I fired it up again and I thought well I'm getting it because see originally I wasn't getting any discharge at all and then I went this big and then I, I think I've got it about that big before I left and I added the little wire and when I get home I'll probably add some more wire to it anyway what we want to do I get distracted is pulse this against an RF ground so what you do is you hook one lead up to ground now I have this problem and what I have seen in messing around with it is if I hook my equipment in between the ground lead and here and 
straight into the coil, it tells me a different frequency than if I do it here. It seems to load down the system. Now, I don't know if it does, uh, and I'm not sure if you do everything the same way, maybe it will all work. That, that has been a thought recently. Of course, my sanity has been kind of a thought too recently. Uh, at any rate, so what I do is, is I try to operate it how it's going to be operated. And we generally operate it with a primary. So I run one, one wire around it. I run it over here to my pulse generator. Or I better not use a pulse generator. My sine wave generator. The reason I pull a sine wave generator is because it will give me my pure frequencies. It will tell me where my quarter wave is. And to my surprise, because a friend of mine told me, he said, you only see one of them. There will be a maximum, and you only see the quarter wavelength. So when I was doing this, let's see if I can get this going the right way. Okay, so that gives me my quarter wave. And I come down here, and I'm playing around with it, and all of a sudden, someplace down here, this starts happening. And I'm saying, whoa, I'm getting two of these. What's happening? Yeah, let me turn it down a little bit. Yeah, that's coming off the top of the coil. Now, granted, you don't want to set it up this way because, well, I'll show you why. Well, just this, okay? <laughs> this does similar. Now, it doesn't do it as wet. doesn't do it as, uh, where'd my wand go? This one was really fun. I'm, this is another one I put a little bit more turns of wire on it so I'd have a little bit better pickup, I hoped. Uh, this one will allow you to, to see a number of things. And it, it affects it a little bit, but not a whole lot. Now, if I can get this in where... Oh, come on, trigger for me. Okay, if you can watch, and you can see the phase relationship, and see how am I going to explain this? This is one cycle. Well, what will happen, it, let me do it this way. You can actually see it go through and change its relationship from this point over to this point so that you run that out of phase. And you can actually watch this come and go with this particular one, which I thought was really neat and interesting and all that kind of stuff. Which is one thing I think that how you're going to have to tune this coil is because I can't find the voltage minimum on this, on this coil for all the things that I put them together. Now I'm getting some impressions that the little coil don't act normal. It does its own thing, and I've got to figure out how to do it yet. But the phase relationship is about the only thing I've been able to come up with that's going to get you close in the ballpark. It's the only thing it gives me, the 42, and not the 64 or 61 or whatever it was, or the 26 for my half wave. I mean, for my quarter wave output. Quarter wave is real easy. All you got to do is look for voltage maximum. That's what we're going. That's what we do up on this big coil. Now, on the big coil or the quarter wave, on the quarter wave coil, you want to set it up how you operate it, and that's with whatever you're going to use for loading. One up, way up there, the red one. Here again, I've I've gone back to my 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 cheap toroid. I think it cost me, what, 11 bucks for eight foot of tubing. Wrap it around, you gotta be real careful with this. It, it is somewhat delicate, you, you bounce it and it, it dents. Of course, with all the corrugations, maybe that doesn't matter. Uh, what I find out is corrugation is no problem. On the big coil, along the corrugations, the only time I had a problem was when I had a sharp point where I put them together and it would arc off there just beautifully. How I learned to control, and, it, and here again, it won't always do what you want it to do. What we did is we kind of, on the big coil, on that one I showed you in the picture, I would drop a wire over the coil and point it where I wanted it to go, which was normally the fence. Except one day I'd been tweaking it up really high, and I'm sitting over the control panel on one little discharge from out here and headed straight over for the operators. Uh. <clears throat> and I decided that they had to go over another two or three feet. It was, it, uh, we say the path of least resistance, or the choice distance between two paths or two points is the path of least resistance except when you're working with Tesla coils. And then it really is, but it's not the path you're used to. It's not a straight line. It's a ionized line. And when you look at Teslas, up and over and down, and it does what it's normally supposed to do. 
we have to understand it, interpret it, what it means, what it's, what it's telling us. And I'm not a very good interpreter, and that's why this doesn't work very well right yet. But I am a tinkerer, and eventually it will work. And then I'll probably use it for displays, and, and I would like to take and do some demonstrations for schools and things like that. This makes it better. I, it's kind of hard to take my eight-footer out to the schools and do demonstration work. Um, the little ones are nice. Uh, I took this, this one here up to a demonstration and had all the kids come up and touch it. I don't like to touch mine because there's a little AC, 60 cycle AC runs around and I can feel it going down through my arm and I don't like that very much. I don't like to be shocked. I think that's why the good Lord made it every time there's a storm come through or something, I shock, get shocked on everything. I got shocked on my fence, I get shocked on my car, I get shocked on doorknobs, I get shocked by my wife, I kiss her, I get shocked on the water pipes. I reached over to get a drink one day and got shocked. So. Uh, maybe he's trying to tell me something, straighten my life up or something. At any rate, um, that's about what, it, what I've got. I'm sorry that I didn't fulfill my, my preset mission to be able to put a piece of equipment here and say, all right, you do this, 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 and this, and it will work for you. And then you put it together, and what you end up doing is a couple things. This is going to be pretty normal. But I've made this, so like, oops, you can like me for that. I can raise this or lower it, so it'll change the capacitance between here. It's a fine-tuning device. I've made it top so I can raise and lower this. Another fine-tuning device. Uh, when I was talking with uh, James, he had indicated that Tesla took his, and probably one of the reasons why I like wood is because it looks so much like Tesla's. Uh, I wish I had the intuition that he had. At any rate, what he did on his coil is once he got it in close, he raised and lowered this sucker until the capacitance was proper to the ground, and then built a stand under it. Um, oh, one other little device. Dwayne Byland. First time I've met him with it was, was within this last month. He's lived in my valley for, in Salt Lake for a long time. In his book, or his deal, he puts a little LED. I don't know if you guys can see that from over there. And if you keep it together, it might work. And go through the frequencies. It did earlier, where are we going? It does on the quarter wave, or the quarter. Well, it was lit a little earlier. I don't know what's wrong with it now. Anyway, pardon? But you, what, I, what I've done is I've got coming out here, I guess I really ought to told you this, so I'm sorry. I come down here, and what I've done is I've got going through an LED, I've got going through a 100-ohm uh, resistor. I think that's what it says. That's why, it, that's why it's not doing what it's supposed to do. I knew I had something at the wrong end. The only bad thing about these demonstrations where you've got to set up a lot of equipment is that you never seem to have time to to do a lot of the stuff you need to do. Oh, but that's not as good. I'm sorry, it, it, it really is. And I, and I, yeah, well, I really apologize for not having more diagrams. I, I had gotten so involved with this that I couldn't think of much else. Of course, I generally don't think. Yeah, of course, I generally don't think of much else. There, yeah, there we go. Anyway, you can do that with a meter. You can put a meter in the circuit, and you can watch the current increase. That will give you your quarter wave. It will give you your half wave. You can use that on your big coil. So for those people that don't have oscilloscopes, there is a way of doing it. Of course, you're you're running blind because you have a lot of faith that that's how it's working, but you can do it. Uh, these, these coils here, I didn't have any equipment. Matter of fact, I didn't, I didn't have a lathe or anything. I had a drill press. Or, well, actually, I had a hand drill. I made my rotary spark gap with a hand drill. I wound my coils with one of those old hand drills by hand. Uh, they're not that hard to make. They're just time consuming. That's why I had a chance to get this, this glass lathe and took it and have modified it because I'm real lazy. I don't like to sit there for two hours trying to look to wind this. Um, this little, well, the big brother to this one here, the one that's eight foot by eight foot, uh, I believe that was uh, Bob Golka 
went out and run a car around his perimeter fence until he got it wound. I'm lazy. I don't like to do those kind of things. So what I did is I put a post up through the center, put two wheels on it, put on a deal and used it as a carousel and then went up the ladder and as I pulled it, first time I'd done it, it took me oh, probably about six or seven hours to get everything put together and wound. The next time I'd done it, I put a post up, run like a merry-go-round, put all my posts back on. It took me about an hour and a half to wind it. It took me half hour to put it up. So I get better with each one. At any rate, the point being, I, I hope you've, well, probably the only thing you've learned is I know how to talk. I don't know how to operate my equipment. I hope that I understand the theory. Uh, I hope you understand that there's more fun in Tesla coil than what I just showed you. What? They're losing me. I've got all the time in the world, I think. Uh, let, let me finish one thing and then I'll, I'll get with you. That was one reason why I read, read Tesla's statement. I believe that high voltage is going to teach us things we've never known. When you look back through the physics books, in the early 1800s, we were getting into static charges, we were getting into static motors. Then along come DC and batteries, and static kind of disappeared. We had the Van der Graaff, well, the Van der Graaffs come quite a little bit later, they were up in the 30s. Lamhursts and some of the old static charge generators. Then along come AC, and we went into high voltage and in high to gear. Um, then all of a sudden, the tubes come along and high voltage started going out a little bit. We got, we got away from the spark gaps. And a lot of the technology, it seems like every time technology just gets to the point where it's going to do something, something that comes along and replaces it and never gets completed. If you look back, the Van de Graaff generators went up until the big one at MIT in 1936. And of course, Tesla commented on that and says, well, this is all fine. You'd run a belt and you'd discharge and that. But my coils were doing things continuously all the time and on demand. Um, Got to make sure my tail's out there so they can get me back there. Um, and all of a sudden, start to see Tesla coils die away. We've seen Van de Graaff generators die away. Look in any of the physics books, modern physics books now, and you very rarely see anything on high voltage. We've all gone to computers. We've all gone to 58 volts, 400 amps, and we've lost a section of beautiful phenomena, as Tesla said, that is no longer going to exist unless we fire these things up and entreat in, in our kids. If I had well, back in 1958, there was a gentleman, I was, my dad was in the Navy, and there was a gentleman come by and propose 100 volts off of his fingertips. Well, dad got angry at me and something, and I'd never made it. Uh, I think the good Lord was protecting my father because if I'd, uh, if I'd had a coil, he'd had to find some place to put it, or I'd have snuck it in the car, or I'd have done something, and he would have been really angry if he'd have found it because once I got my coil together, I, as you see, this, these are some of the coils I have. It's not all the coils. When I started working with Mar March of Dimes Haunted Houses, my coils kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until at some point I had to say, whoa, just a second here, I gotta, I gotta stop this. I've kind of retrogressed with these. These are the smallest coils I've made in a long time. Of course, they're the only coils I've made in a long time. But I have played around with the rest of them. At any rate, that concludes it. Uh, is there any questions that I can't answer? <laughs> a whole bunch, I imagine. What you're trying to do here, I think, is you're trying to set up an extra coil system on a primary and secondary. Right. Trying to bottom load, bottom feed this extra coil over here. Um, from what I understand, and you've been obviously reading the core of work, um, they were using a more tightly coupled primary secondary. Oh, sure, I understand that. That's that's not a problem. See, my primary isn't on there yet. Okay. Okay. Just that's just. One turn around there just for testing purposes. Yes, but it, it it will probably be a one turn. When I fired it up, this this was the primary that I fired up with the other day. There's one. What, three turns, four turns? Okay, so there isn't really very many. I like one turn coils for primaries. They give you maximum power. But the problem with it, the trade off is, is you gotta be real careful with your coupling. Now I've compensated that with, on, on my bigger coil, what I've done is I've got a rotary spark gap and I've got two air gaps. One of them's fixed and one of them's adjustable. Uh, I also run a blower on it so that I blow the ionized, ionized, ionized air. Also, it helps keep them cool, and I find out that I've got some big balls that they use for uh, busting up rocks. And so I've had somebody weld one on, and that's how, what I use for my balls, and it still burns holes out of that, and I've got to clean them up every once in a while. By using that air gap, I can actually tune it. Now, a real good example uh, for me was the one that Tesla put in his diary, because I've seen this 
vividly demonstrated to me uh, for two reasons. One is I had had impressions it was larger. I'd build a coil for a system for a kid, and that's how we were going to set the, the rotary spark gap up. Uh, but in the meantime, I didn't want to do it that way, so I set it up the way I normally set it up and fiddled with it until I got it to work properly. And it was a coil very much similar to this, that size there, and we put a toroid on top of it and so forth and so on. His motor, I timed it one day, cold. Start to full RPMs was four minutes. So it was, it took a long time to get up there. And one day I got impatient when, we'd, when we, I got ready to give it to him and fired it up. And as it went up through the, the oscillations and the different RPMs, spark kept getting longer and longer and longer. And I was sitting here, whoa, just a second here. And I started bending over my bench because was, this was another room that I had that was real tight. And I was like this. And I thought, gee, this must be my imagination. So what I did is when the kid came, I said, hey, I want to show you this. Let me fire it up. So I plugged it in and done the same thing. And he took two steps back. So obviously, we had improved it. Now, what I think, and I think Tess probably gives the analogy, but my analogy is what it is, if you've seen it in the diary, it's the one wheel with the little points coming out of it. He has a ball here, and he goes out here and has a ball on the outside of the, the box, and he has another ball. In a normal Tesla coil, depending upon how you have that gap, depends upon what the voltage is that's going to arc across there. If you pull that gap further apart, the voltage has got to be higher to arc across there. So if you put the ones in close to the wheel, real close, and you put the ones out on the outside and make them adjustable, you start picking off the top of your power system. And it gives it a kick that you, you might find if you want to play around with it that way, that you didn't expect. I didn't expect it, it shocked me. Well, not literally. Anyway, he's telling me to go. I'm finished, I guess. And that, unless there's any other questions. Are you closing down the room? Or some... off the tape and you can keep hanging out. Okay. Do you use any chokes? Yes, I'm a big coil like